By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the Paladins of the North Cup and we have reached round number six. This is the last round of the Swiss. After this we're going to jump into the top eight and I've got the quarterfinals, semifinals and finals ready for you on this channel. But today we're going to look at the round number six match between David who's playing a deck that I've called Atok Blast. It's mono red and he's taking on a deck that's called The Witcher. It's white and it's blue and it's piloted by Edo. And I mean, it's such a cool deck. Before I start with the deck decks, because I've got beautiful deck photos of both of these decks, I would just like to point out that if you want to skip the deck deck or watch the deck deck after the match, I know some of you do, the easiest way to, to do that is by checking the description below, because there you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, it will take you straight to the action, so you can just skip the deck tech section and also uh, you can check the description to find out more about the specific rule sets of this tournament i can already tell you that they are playing according to the swedish rules that means no fallen empires and no a mana burn okay now that that is out of the way we are going to start with the deck tech i'm going to start with the deck of david atok blast let's have a look and here we see the deck of David Atok Blast. And I can already see some really sweet cards in here that I'm hoping to see in action. Um, let's just start at the left side of the deck and work our way kind of through the list. So on the left side, we see four bolts, nothing new there. We see two chain lightnings. That's kind of interesting, choosing to play with two chains instead of a full four. Then we see two fireballs. And here it gets kind of interesting for me at least, because I love to see this card detonate. It's a card from the antiquities, a sorcery, one red and X to cast. And the X is the amount of the artifact that you're trying to destroy with Detonate. For example, if you want to target your GM Day Tome of your opponent, the X cost is 4 because the casting cost of GM Day Tome is 4. The cool thing of Detonate is that it doesn't only destroy the artifact that you're targeting, it also deals damage to your opponent equal to the casting cost of the artifact, right? So if you destroy that GM Day Tome, you're going to deal 4 damage to your opponent as well. And that's, of course, fantastic value. Now the downside of this is you do in some cases need a lot of mana in order for detonate to work. It's also sorcery speed so you're kind of tapping out in your turn and you cannot target that much hated Mistress Factory with it because Mistress Factory is usually not a creature uh, in, 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 in your turn, you know, so if your opponent animates it in his turn, then you cannot target it with detonate. Of course, you know, there are scenarios where maybe your opponent has animated it in your turn and you can uh, destroy it with detonate still. Um, another really interesting card here is Disharmony. I really love seeing this card. It doesn't see a lot of play, unfortunately, but it's so cool. It's a one red and two to cast from Legends. And what it does is if your opponent attacks, you can play this harmony and you can steal one of the creatures that your opponent is attacking with. It comes to your side of the board, it untaps. And then of course you can use it as a blocker or use it any way you like. We also see diamond valleys in here so you can steal it and sack it to the diamond valley, for example. Or you can do both in an ideal scenario. Let's say your opponent is attacking with um, a Mahamoti Jin and a Suchi. You can steal the Mahamoti Jin block the Suchi, kill the Suchi of your opponent, and then feed the Mahamoti Jin to your Diamond Valley and also gain six life. Obviously, this is a dream scenario, but it is possible. And I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for David here. I'm hoping he gets used to disharmony. Um, then we also see the Falling Star, of course, that's kind of like Chaos Orb's little brother. So you got to flip it um, as well, just like the Chaos Orb. And then whatever it hits, it deals three damage to that. And it also taps... Uh, the targets that it hits. So that's quite an interesting thing that sometimes people forget is it also taps the creatures that it hits. And I think in like kind of an ideal flip because the cards cannot overlap, you can hit up to six targets with one Falling Star. I mean, you've got to be really, really good at flipping the uh, Falling Star, but it has happened. Um, then when we look at the uh, third row, we see the Mana Volts. Mana Volts, of course, are a great artifact to use in combination with the Atok, right? That's kind of the dream thing. Then we also see Black Vices. Black Vice, great in an Atok deck because if they're not useful, you can still feed them to the Atok. You know, they can just be little um, giant groves for the Atok. I also always like the uh, Black Vice in combination with the Wheel of Fortune. And Black Vice, of course, is also a great card against those nasty blue uh, players that always love to draw those cards. Man, they really suck, don't they, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, then we see the two Atox we discussed earlier, and we see the four Rook X. So this is an 0-3 creature from Arabian Nights, 
And when it dies, you get a 4-4 bird token at the end of your turn. And that, of course, works really well with those two Diamond Valleys we see there on the right, right? You can feed them to Diamond Valley, gain three life, and also get a 4-4 bird. The Rook Egg also works fantastically with Chain Lightning because you can play Chain Lightning, deal three damage to your own egg, and then you can pay two red and choose a new target because you've targeted yourself, and you can play it again. So if you have two Rook Eggs on the table, you could destroy both of your Rook X and then also deal three more damage to your opponent, for example, or another creature of your opponent, whatever target you want to choose. So Rook Egg and uh, Chain Lightning, that's just a combination, right? The, the two are made for each other, you could say. Um, then we're seeing the four Suchis. So Suchi and again, Diamond Valley could be interesting in certain scenarios where you sac uh, your Suchi to the Diamond Valley to get those four mana and use those four mana, for example, to beef up your fireball maybe to make it lethal um, it's something that i've done in the past and it's a lot of fun when it works um, it doesn't happen often but when it does it's nice what i also like is the combination between jam day tome and suchi because usually when the suchi gets destroyed it's in your combat and then you can only use uh, those mana to kind of for fast effects so for example you can use the four mana to draw a card with the jam day tome if you've got it on the table so that's quite nice then of course we see the mighty terskelion only three, not the full four, um, which is quite interesting. I think when when you're working on this deck, I know that David has been working on this deck for a while. You're probably constantly tweaking, right? Am I going to do three Chain Lightnings or two? Am I going to do two Fireballs or one? Am I going to play Disintegrate instead? So it's really always interesting to see what kind of list um, David is at now and if we will see any changes at another tournament. Maybe, David, uh, if you're watching this video, could you let us know what your latest tweaks are and, and how you feel about, you know, the current deck? What are some cards you're doubting about? What are cards you feel uh, really confident about? We also see one um, City in a Bottle, which is pretty cool because City in a Bottle doesn't destroy tokens that are created by Arabian Night cards. So this is quite interesting to note, right? So there could be a situation where David has multiple... A rook X on the board. Then he plays his City in the Bottle. City in the Bottle destroys those Rook X. That means he gets a 4-4 Bird Token. That Bird Token is not destroyed by, um, by the City in the Bottle. Another interesting thing to note, by the way, is that you cannot target tokens with your Chaos Orb. I've seen it happen a few times. It's not possible. So that makes tokens slightly better in old school, I guess. Okay, so this is the deck of David. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Edo. And here we see the deck of Edo. So I've called it The Witcher. And I mean, there's something special happening with this deck, but also with this matchup, because both players are playing with Diamond Valley and both players have a plan with Diamond Valley, right? So that is that is just really cool. Um, David's playing with two Diamond Valleys, but Edo is playing with one more. He's playing with three Diamond Valleys main. And the reason for that is pretty obvious when we're looking at his deck, right? He's got a lot of ways to steal creatures. So we see four control magics in this deck. Of course, it's ideal when you can steal the best creature of your opponent with the control magic. And as soon as your opponent is trying to do something against that, maybe play a disenchant, which of course in this matchup is not possible because uh, David is not playing with white or green. So he doesn't have a way actually to destroy an enchantment. He, he can chaos orb, I guess. So let's say David wants to flip potentially on the control magic that in response, Edo can say, you know what? If I cannot have your creature, then nobody can. I'm going to destroy it to my Diamond Valley. So Diamond Valley and Control Magic is a great combination because it means you always get value. Uh, talking about a great combination, Preacher and Diamond Valley is a great combination. So Preacher is this card from the dark that has a very blue ability, right? It's a 1-1 one, one for two white and one, a summon Preacher that reads, um, tap for as long as Preacher remains tapped, gain control of target creature of an opponent's choice they control, and then you may choose not to untap Preacher during your untap step, right? So you can just keep your uh, Preacher tapped. Now the thing is, your opponent gets to choose what creature you get. So he's probably not gonna choose his best creature. Now, the cool thing is, if you steal it with Preacher, you can sack that creature to Diamond Valley, then your next turn you can untap your Preacher again and say, you know what? The creature I stole, it's it's gone. I know what happened. I gained some life. It's gone. So I'm going to tap my preacher again. And please give me another one. So you can slowly eat away all the creatures of your opponent with Preacher and Diamond Valley on the board. It's very brutal. The downside, of course, with these creatures, and the same thing goes for the Witcher, uh, the Witch Hunter, I mean, I'll, I'll discuss that card in a moment, is they're small. They're just 1-1 one, one creatures. He's playing against red. So a well-aimed Fireball can probably take out multiple of these 1-1s. One, also, of course, a bolt and a chain 
are great uh, answers as well to these threats. So let's kind of focus on the Witch Hunter, another card we see in this deck. Now the Witch Hunter and Preacher, again, a really good combo. Witch Hunter is a two white and two for a one one summon hunter that has again a very blue ability, but it's in a white jacket. You can tap it and it deals one damage to target player or planeswalker. So we don't have any planeswalkers in old school. Well, we're the planeswalkers, so it just one point of damage to the opponent. So it's not like a Timmy, a Timmy is a bit more versatile, but it's got a really cool second time elemental ability. Uh, two white and one and tap, return target creature and opponent controls to its owner's hand. So again, this goes great with the preacher. If you don't have, if your opponent has two uh, creatures on board and you only want to steal one of those, you can send that other creature back with the, uh, the witch hunter. And that means that there's only one creature on the board left and you tap your preacher and your opponent has to give that one creature to you, right? So it's a way to kind of make sure that your opponent chooses the right creature by combining witch hunter with Preacher, another really nice thing here is in this matchup, and this is really bad news for David, Edo can use the Witch Hunter to send back the 4-4 bird tokens. And we all know what happens when you unsummon a bird token, they die. They just, they, they disappear into dust. They're nowhere to be found. So this is really bad news for David. I think it's up to David to really try to take care of those witch hunters. There they could be a huge problem for David in this matchup. Now we also see another creature on the board that I'm super excited about to see play. That's King Suleiman. King Suleiman, one white and one for a summon king from Arabian Nights. You can tap it to destroy target Jinn or a freak. Now I think it's super cool that Edo is playing with this card. He can also say, you know what, I'm gonna play with City in a bottle like so many people do. He's saying, well, first off, I've got Diamond Valley. So Diamond Valley and Sydney in the bottle, that may not work together very well. And instead, I'm going to go for the cool way to kill uh, Jins and Afrits. And that's, of course, King Suleiman. I mean, look at this card. I think it's awesome. I think it's super cool, Edo, that you're playing it. When I'm looking at your deck, I think it's it's very original. Uh, you're doing quite well at this tournament. So I'm, I'm rooting for you. Although I have to say, I also really like David's deck. I guess... The danger of decks like this is you do need opponents that play with a lot of creatures. If you've got opponents that don't play with a lot of creatures or you've got an opponent that plays with Earthquake, for example, I mean, it could be quite painful. But you're doing quite well. Uh, I mean, white-blue is always a good color combination. So um, let's just go to the match, shall we, and see how this is going to end up. Let's go to David versus Edo. Game number one, we've got David sitting on the left. Look at his opener hand. We see City in a Bottle, Triskelion, Falling Star, a Rook Egg, and a Mistress Factory. Pretty good hand, not too quick though. Here's the hand of Ada. We see a Preacher, uh, the Witch Hunter, Diamond Valley, and is that another Preacher? That was kind of hard to see, or a Witch Hunter there in hand. But he's got the combination Diamond Valley and Preacher. So that's pretty nice. There we see a Mishra's Factory played by David. So he's a player on the left playing with the Mono Red deck with Atox and Rook X. Ooh, there we see a Black Lotus. Second the Lotus, tapping at Plains. Oh, ho, ho, turn one Witch Hunter. That is so sweet. So this is really old school magic, isn't it? A turn one Witch Hunter. I've never seen that before. This is epic. And I guess David is now gonna attack for two possibly, right? Does he have better options? And Edo can start pinging from turn one. That is so cool. And it looks like he's looking uh, at what the card does. Of course, you don't see Witch Hunter often. Now remember, uh, it can also uh, unsummon creatures of the opponent, but uh, you do need a lot of mana to do that. I believe two white and one and tap to use that unsummon ability. And you can just tap it to deal one damage to target opponent. So he's gonna drop you to 18, David animating the factory. And uh, yeah, really, really cool move here by Edo. Let's see what else he can do. There is a strip mine. I think this is a good decision because you're slowing your opponent down and you're taking care of a threat. So that makes sense. There we see a second red. And of course, you know, when you're playing against like a four color or five color deck, it's usually better to strip mine a specific dual land, but in this case, I think it's better to use the strip mine on that uh, Mishra's factory. And also remember, it's hard for, in a way, harder for Edo to deal with the Mishra's factory than to deal with a normal creature, because he can use his control magics against that. Um, he can use his witch hunter and preacher anytime he wants against those cards, so that just works better. We see just one basic island being uh, 
put on the board by Edo and a pass turn. So Edo, of course, he took uh, a point of damage from the Vice. So he's on 17 at the moment. And Davids is still on 19. Oh, he's missing a land drop here. There we see a Bolt is still taking a damage though. Don't think you can prevent that, to be honest. Maybe I'm making a mistake then. Anyway, he, he doesn't take the damage. I'm sure the players know best. There is a Preacher on the board taking a damage from his own city, going to 15. And this is difficult, you know, for um, for David. There's another Mistress Factory. There is a pass. So this game is just, you know, slowly progressing. There are no quick starts. I thought maybe David would get out of the gate quickly with, for example, a Mana Volt or a Suchi. Uh, followed up by a Suchi, I should say, but that didn't happen. There is a Diamond Valley. So this is a great combo for Edo to have online. But all he needs now is some creatures from David, but I'm sure David is not going to play them out. There is an attack here. So he's kind of showing to David that he has a way to deal with the factory. Tapping two here. And there he's casting a King Suleiman. So the 2-2 creature that you can tap to kill target um, Jin or Afrit. It's not going to be very useful uh, in this matchup. So I think that Edo is probably going to board it out in game number two. So David plays his own strip line and he's now a little bit in the tank what to do it's it's really difficult to play against an active preacher one of the things he can do of course now is animate the factory there is a risk that he'll then find the swords to plowshares there's a falling star interesting this is in a way also risky because he's now using one falling star well he has two targets i guess this is really sweet a falling star i'm already loving this game we had a turn one witch hunter now we've got a falling star Oh, and it hits both! It hits both of them! It looked like a little bit like a sloppy flip, but it hit both targets, so it, it did the job. So it's a nice two-for-one here for David, but, I mean, it is one of the better cards against the deck of Edo, because Edo is playing, remember, three Witch, witch Hunters, four Preachers, so, I mean, it's, it's just great to use it against those creatures. I'm just expecting another, maybe, Preacher here or Witch Hunter... There is another Preacher, yeah, they're just, you know, remember a full playset, he's only lost one so far. So he still has plenty in his deck. There we see a Mountain, also very good in this matchup, by the way, are of course the Triskelions for David. They're just awesome against all those little 1-1s one -ones on the side of Edo. If you're David, what you could do here is animate your factory and attack. Of course, there's always a little risk that your opponent then plays uh, Swords to Plowshares. Although I don't think that's in the list of Edo. But of course, David doesn't know that. So maybe he doesn't want to take the risk and he just wants to climb up to 6 mana as fast as he can. Perhaps he's got a Triskelion in hand. We just don't know. But was there a trike in his opener? I kind of forgot. Perhaps there was. Because then it makes sense. Then you really want to protect your mana. You want to go up to 6 as fast as you can. Because you can play your Triskelion, and then of course Edo can say, I want to steal your Triskelion, but in response to that, you can shoot a counter to the Preacher and kill it. So Trike is just a great weapon against Preacher. There is a tap for four. There is a Witch Hunter. And there's a pass. So this just means another target for David here. If he can find a trike, that would be kind of a game changer here. And these games can take long because, you know, when you've got a preacher and a witch hunter against you, you just don't just want to play out your, your, your creatures. You don't want to feed your creatures to your opponent. Also with the Diamond Valley on the board, so it's understandable that 
David is just passing here. For Edo, this is a good scenario because he can start pinging with the Witch Hunter. Looking at his cards again, three cards in hand at the moment. Um, Edo is on 14. David's on 18 still. There's another land, City of Brass. So just two cards. Perhaps he's thinking, if I attack and he animates and then I can steal it with the Preacher, that could be a scenario that he's thinking about. But yeah, I agree with this move just past turn. Just don't do it, you know, it's too risky. Then you can deal the damage on end step. David, I think David is really trying hard to find land number six to play out the Triskelion. That would be such a game changer here. Three cards in hand now for Edo. Of course, Edo is playing with counter magic as well. So the best answer for him, of course, is to just counter a possible trike. Tapping one white, there is a soul ring. An altered one, it seems, and there's a pass. Edo has a very cool altar collection and signed card collection. There's another damage dealt by the Witch Hunter. It's a slow game, but it works. David now on 16. There we see four and another Witch Hunter. I mean, Edo is really committing to the board here, which is risky. Remember, he's also playing with Fireball. Chain Lightning, Lightning Bolt. Interesting. And he's still taking one point of damage. And are we going to see a counter spell? We see a counter spell to save the untapped Witch Hunter. And th this is quite interesting. He's going to eat the other one. That makes sense. But it's quite interesting here, this move that he's choosing to protect the Witch Hunter with a counter spell. It is in a way understandable, but I think maybe it's better to keep the counter spell for a fireball or for uh, a trike. Now obviously I've seen the list, so I kind of know what cards David is playing with. Edo has not. And you also got to play in the moment, of course. You kind of think, oh, but he also has a better card in his deck, so I'll just let this one go. There we see a Thunder Spirit, and that's actually quite nice. Because he can start dealing some more damage. It flies over the uh, Mishra's factory. Although, of course, Edo doesn't, wouldn't mind David to animate his factory. And David just spent his Chain Lightning and Lightning Bolt. So he probably doesn't have an answer at the moment. Or does he? Okay, there's a Soul Ring. Now, does he have a Trike? He's got six mana now. He could cast it, but of course... Is he going to go for it? Is he going to go for it? Or are we going to see a counter spell? Does Edo have a counter spell here? He so desperately needs it if this is going to hit the board. And it is. He is going to kill the creatures here. And he's going to steal. He's going to steal the trike in response to the ping. I think that's possible, but then the preacher is going to die to that counter. But of course, he, he does have it, and he can sack it possibly to the Diamond Valley. I'm not quite sure here what's going to happen. We'll just have to wait and see. There's a little discussion here. I do know that in response, David can pay one to kill the Preacher, but obviously he doesn't want to do that. He wants to keep that counter on. Yeah, so he's going to deal one point of damage here to Edo. This is exactly what's happening. And that means that it's still a good trade for David. What David could have done is wait with dealing a damage to the Preacher and say, okay, if you're going to steal it, then in response I'm going to deal a damage to it. And then he also could... No, it wouldn't have changed much, by the way, because then he still wouldn't have enough counters to also kill the Thunder Spirit. 
So David now on 12, after taking two points of damage from the Thunder Spirit. There is a Mana Volt and of course one still floating. And I wonder what he's going to do here. Looking at his hand. And it looks like he's gonna tap some, no it's not. I thought it was tapping something. He still has his one mana floating from the soul ring. I mean, I guess he wants to deal with the Thunder Spirit, but it's obvious that he doesn't have a bolt in hand or anything else to deal with the Thunder Spirit. He could, of course, consider to play a Fireball on it, but you really want to not use your Fireball on a 2-2 Flyer. It just doesn't feel good at this point in the game. He's tapping four. We're going to see a Suichi. Tapping five, one floating, another trike. This is really good news here for David. Those trikes are now very dominated, dominating the game. I mean, this is just really, really good. He can, of course, use two counters next turn to kill the Thunder Spirit if he wants to. And then he will still have one counter to kill one of those 1-1 one -one creatures that Edo depends on so much. There's the attack song. He's actually taking the damage. So he's gonna decide to attack for four here next turn, probably. There we see a tap, gonna take a damage from City of Brass. And, ooh, control magic. Yeah, 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 this is a great answer. So I guess if you're David, you now wanna kill the Thunder Spirit, and then it can kill itself. Exactly, that's what he's gonna do. So two points of damage to the Thunder Spirit, and he's gonna kill itself. And I guess in response, Edo could have used the Diamond Valley here to tank some life, choosing not to though. And there we see another Thunder Spirit and a pass turn. Interesting here. So the trikes are, are great, but Edo kind of manages his way around the Triskelions. And David on 10, Edo on 11, both life scores very close together. This is still everybody's game. Tapping lots of mana. Are we going to see a big fireball? We're going to see a rook egg and two rook eggs in total. And oh, there's a city in the bottle. I love this play. This is a play we talked about in the introduction. This is just fantastic. It also destroys two city of brasses. Oh man, this is fantastic. And of course, the diamond valley on the side of Edo. This is so, so, so brutal. Now he's got four, four flyers in the air. And he's gonna pass turn. This is a great turn here for David. This is potentially a winner here of game one after this play. This is amazing. It also nullifies that Thunder Spirit because it's just a 2-2 flyer now. It cannot win against those big 4-4 bird tokens. A nice thing to note, by the way, is that people often think that the bird token is like what comes out of the Rook Egg. It's actually not, it's the mother of the egg. After it's being destroyed, it comes back to the nest. It's furious and it wants to know what happened. That's a little lore info here for you guys. There we see uh, uh, the uh, strip mine being used to take care of the island. Makes sense because you're cutting off a color. I'm expecting an attack here of two four force. Yeah, that's what he's going to do. I think it's a good decision. There we see, okay, so we do see a Swords to Plowshare, so he is playing with Swords. And he's also taking four points of damage here, so he's going to seven. There we see a Detonate on the Soaring, so a very aggressive attack now on the mana base. And of course that works hand in hand with that City in the bottle earlier, taking care of the two City of Brasses and the Diamond Valley. And now he takes care of the Soaring and that one basic island. There we see a Tundra attack for two. David's gonna drop to 12. And I think he can actually finish it now. He can animate the factory and attack. And I guess Edo still has an answer in hand then. So he's gonna, add, no, that's it, that's it. Six points of damage, Edo is gone. He could have lasted maybe one more turn, but I don't think it would have uh, helped him much. So both players are now gonna go to their sideboards and we're gonna catch, uh, catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So it's one game up for David, the player on the left. 
And here we see the hand of Edo. I saw a counter spell there. It looks like he's taking a mulligan. Here we see the hand of David. Again, a trike. Disharmony, pretty sweet. And a rook egg and enough mana. So he's going to keep this one. And then there we see the shuffle by Edo. Interesting that he kept Disharmony in his deck, by the way. Because I don't think there are many creatures that Edo is going to attack with. You know, he's not going to attack with the creature, he's not going to attack with, uh, with the Witch Hunters. And I think, I guess he could use Disharmony when, you know, Edo steals a creature from him, but then again in response, Edo could use his Diamond Valley. I think Disharmony against this deck is not great, I probably would have boarded it out. Then again, I don't know what the other options are in the deck of David. And Disharmony can still be good, it can still be a good surprise card. Anyway, uh, we see that... Edo is keeping this hand, so taking one card on the bottom for that Mulligan earlier. And he's probably on the play after losing that first game. Let's see what he's going to do. There we see a Tundra and a pass turn. There is a Mishra's Factory into Mana Vault. So it's a pretty good start here for David. Is he going to find perhaps a Suchi. Remember, he had a Triskelion in his opening hand, so that's also great to play the next turn. Playing a Mountain, probably not going to attack here with the Factory. There's just too much danger of a Disenchant or a Swords. He is not. He's just going to pass turn here. And are we going to see a Disenchant? There's a Disenchant on the Mana Vault. I mean, it's, it's, it's not great for David, but it's not too bad. There's a soul ring and another land, a city of brass. Is he going to cast a witch hunter or a preacher? No, he's not. Just passing turn. There is another factory and a pass. So both players just building up right now. And I agree here with David not wanting to attack with the uh, Mishra's factories. Because, you know, if you attack with them at this stage in the game and you lose another land after losing the Mana Vault, you're just so far behind with mana, you don't want that to happen, so I think it's a good decision. There we see an altered library of Alexandria, by the way, on the side of Edo, so perhaps he's just going to save up now. He's got five cards in hand, I believe, in passing turn. There we see another land for David, so he's got five lands right now, almost enough to cast a Triskelion. I mean, if you're David, you want to put some pressure on forcing Edo to play something out of his hand. So perhaps there's a Suchi coming up now. There's a Rook Egg, of course. He had that in his opener. Don't think he's going to do anything against that. And no, he's not. So just a pass here. On end step, we do see a Swords, which is a great answer to the Rook Egg because it removes it from the game so it doesn't go to the graveyard. And also it gives David zero life because it is an 0-3 creature. It does mean, though, that Edo had to play out another card from his hand. I think the strategy here for Edo could have been to just keep the swords in hand, keep the land in hand, and try to go up to 7 to get that active Loa. Because, you know, an 0-3 creature on its own is not a big threat. There we see an animation and an attack. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised here. Perhaps it's because he's now used his swords to plowshares and a disenchant already, so... David sees a possibility here, pumping the factory to a 317 now for Edo. Looks like he's gonna tap four mana here, and there's a Gem Tome. That is great right now in this game. There is a Black Lotus and a pass. Again, a little bit surprised that he plays out the Black Lotus. We don't know what's in his hand, though. Maybe he has his reasons. I would be tempted to keep it in hand, especially since David is also not playing with a Mind Twist or a Balance. Are we going to see that Trike right now? He's going to tap 5, it seems. Ooh, there's a Detonate on the Jam Day Tome, and this is exactly what you want to do. Are we going to see a Counterspell here? I think we're going to see a Counterspell. Yeah, there's a Counterspell. That is a very important Counterspell. There is a Red Elemental Blast coming in from the sideboard. There is his sack. Now he's going to draw at least a card from the Gemde Tome. But this is great for David because David is also dealing four points of damage with that Detonate. So he's then going to drop. I'm a little bit surprised here why he's gaining life. 
They're a little bit in, in a discussion here, trying to find out what the right situation is. I believe he was on 17. Then he took a damage from his own city of brass, going to 16. Then he's going to draw a card. Then it gets destroyed with a death in it, and he takes four more points of damage, and he goes to 12. Exactly. Now, just to clarify, these players know each other very well, so it's just a very relaxed chat about, you know, where were we at, how's it with the damage. And I mean, this is actually pretty devastating for Edo because that Jam Dayton was very important, also in combination with the Library of Alexandria. You know, getting a Library of Alexandria online is huge. And here we see an attack of 2-2-2, two, 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 so he's going to drop to 8. So he's really keeping that trike in hand until he sees Edo playing out a Preacher. At least that's what I think he's doing. And in the meanwhile, he can just attack with his factories, which is great. A Northern Paladin, that is pretty sweet. From the Paladins of the North Cup. That is sweet. So he's playing one main because he's at the Paladins of the North Cup. I think uh, I think Edo should get a prize for this. Maybe you already did Edo, let me know in the comments below, but it's great flavor that you're playing one main. Super cool. And there's an attack, so Paladin is a 3-3, so he could chump block it, potentially he's choosing not to do it. So he's gonna drop to five. Ooh, now he's getting very close to getting killed. There we see the Triskelion that David has had on hand for so long. So next turn could be the last turn for Edo. What is he going to do here? Tapping the Tundra. Okay, tapping four. There's a Control Magic. Ooh, a Red Elemental Blast. Those Red Elemental Blasts are really, really, really good for David here in this matchup. Two very well-timed Red Elemental Blasts to cancel the counter spell earlier on the Gem Day Tome and now to cancel that Control Magic. That makes a huge difference. And even if Edo has a Preacher here, it can be easily shut down. And it's got Summoning Sickness as well. There is another Control Magic. So he's gonna steal the trike, I guess. And yep, he's gonna kill him. Of course I missed that part. He had to tap down his both of his City of Brasses. That meant that he went down to three life. And then uh, David could kill him easily with the three remaining counters on the Chris Killing. So this is the 2-0 victory here for David. But we saw a lot of fun plays. And I really love the deck of Edo, but I also love the deck of David, he's made a lot of different choices than the obvious Atok Bruise, and I, I've got to applaud that, I love seeing that, and that play where he played City in a Bottle uh, to destroy his own Rook X, that was majestic, that was beautiful, David, man, well done, congrats on the victory, and uh, probably on a great result in this tournament as well, talking about the tournament, we will be back uh, next time, the next uh, Timmy Talks episode, with the quarterfinals of the Northern Paladins Cup. And in that quarterfinals, we're going to see Dion take on Ron. And these are the two decks. So we've got a deck that I've called the Two Decor because it only exists out of core set cards. We've already seen it in action here in Groningen. And it's reached the quarterfinals. It's going to take on, it's a deck by Dion, by the way. And it's going to take on Ron with his famous Rook Valley deck. This is a deck that almost always performs. Uh, Ron is just really good at tweaking this deck, playing with this deck. I love seeing both brews because they are so personal. When I see the decks, I know exactly what player is playing with them. And I love that stuff. You know, I love it when wizards take it to the next level and make a personal deck. I think that's great. Anyway, this is the quarterfinal. So if you want to uh, make sure you watch that match, make sure you are subscribed to the channel and ring that bell. And if you're already subscribed, great, you know, thank you for supporting the channel. There are three more things that you can do to support the channel. That is, of course, liking this video. That's the first thing you can do. It's completely free. Just hit that thumbs up. You can also leave a comment to the video. Let me know if you like these series. And the last thing you can do is share it on your socials. All this is completely free. And, you know, it's a small thing for you to do, but it really helps the channel grow further and further. YouTube loves that stuff you know when it sees that the youtube channel is getting a lot of uh, uh comments a lot of thumbs up then uh, youtube says you know what i'm going to recommend your content and they're actually going to help me 
grow my channel. So I'm kind of hoping to get there with the support of all of you. Now there's one other thing that you can do and that is that you can become a patron of the channel by um, clicking on the Patreon link that's appearing right now. So a little info card that's popping up. If you click on there, that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page and there you can support the channel financially as well and it already starts with one dollar a month and the cool thing is if you join the patreon program you get access to the discord if you're become if you become a patreon in, at the tier two or tier three level you can also play a game with me how cool is that you know uh, we can make an episode together if you want to of course and uh, your name will also be mentioned in the end scroll what end scroll well the end scroll that's coming up right now so let's take a look at our fantastic wunderbar amazing patrons and channel members of timmy talks here we go Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee. 